After three months of fighting in Mariupol, it all comes down to this. The charred tangle of the Azovstal steel plant, the last remnants of Ukrainian resistance. Footage released today by the Russian-backed separatists in Donetsk showed their relentless bombing of the plant. Ukraine said the Russians were storming the plant and their soldiers had for the first time entered the perimeter. As ever in this war of weapons and words, Moscow denied all of that. With Vladimir Putin today ordering the remaining soldiers to surrender. Somehow, life still emerges from underneath. Yesterday, 344 citizens were evacuated from the city, with President Zelensky saying they had all safely arrived overnight in Zaporizhia. A three-day ceasefire to allow more to leave was meant to begin today, with both sides accusing the other of not keeping their promises. But just fleeing isn't safety, because other cities aren't far off becoming the next Mariupol. Just ask Ludmila in Kramatorsk, in another part of Ukrainian-held Donbass. At least 25 civilians were wounded after shelling in this city. They sweep away the shrapnel, but the scars and the shock remains. Kyiv today said it crucially needed multiple launch rocket systems to defend against these types of Russian missile attacks. As the Ukrainians await more Western equipment, the Russians have been targeting the country's infrastructure to stop or slow down any such deliveries. And despite persistent attacks, the Russians are stuck on the Eastern Front, making no major headway in recent days. Even Putin's cheerleader-in-chief in this so-called special operation, Belarus's Alexander Lukashenko, admitted this wasn't following the Kremlin's script. Но я не настолько погружен в эту проблему, чтобы сказать, по плану там у них идет у россиян, как они говорят, или так, как я это ощущаю. Я еще раз подчеркиваю, я это ощущаю так, что операция эта затянулась. Preparations for Moscow's big Victory Day parade next week, when Russia marks the end of World War II, or what they call the Great Patriotic War. Vladimir Putin will hope to shift the narrative to Russia's might. Today they said they had practiced simulated nuclear-capable missile strikes in the Baltic Sea. For Monday's parade, they've been practicing both day and night in Red Square. All these soldiers' gazes are fixed to the West, not just towards the Kremlin walls where inside Putin plots, but to Ukraine's front line. Because Putin needs something to show off to his public come Victory Day. And the question is, what does victory look like? Well, our international editor, Lindsay Hilson, joins us now from Pokrovsk in the eastern Donetsk region. Uh, Lindsay, tell us about the situation on the ground where you are. Well, the situation on the ground, Matt, doesn't look much like victory for the Russians at the moment. The Russian border is about 350 kilometres north of where I am. And three weeks ago, Russian soldiers came down there to a place called Izum with the idea of forcing their way further into Donetsk, the region where I am. They seem to have more or less got stuck. But what has happened in that time is that the Ukrainians west of there have started to move in between the Russian border and where the Russian troops have come down to. They haven't got in between yet, but that's clearly where they're heading and they are planning a major onslaught apparently in the coming days. They've already taken some territory. So that has the potential of cutting off Russian supply lines, which would of course be a huge problem. What are the Russians doing? They're firing a lot of missiles and artillery. They hit a place called Kramatorsk this morning, which is on the front line east of here, killed 26 people. And there's a lot of artillery also hitting Ukrainian soldiers. The Ukrainians never talk about how many men they are losing, but believe me, they are taking casualties. This war, we don't really know the cost of it yet, but it's quite high, both in terms of soldiers and civilians. And uh, tell us about this other way the Americans are trying to help the Ukrainians. There's obviously the weapons we've reported on a lot. And what's the other way? 
well, it's intelligence. And I think that what we're seeing at the moment is a, is a tension in what the Americans are trying to do. On the one hand, they're trying to show the Russians, to give the message, we are there behind the Ukrainians all the way. Do not think that just by keeping at it, you are going to crush Ukraine, because you're not, because we're there. That's the one message. The other message is, no, it's just between you and Ukraine. You're not fighting us. You're not fighting NATO, because that is the Kremlin narrative. So one of the things that they're doing is providing intelligence. But it's not just about troop movements. Anyway, most people can see that on open source um, you know, satellite pictures now. They're providing actionable battlefield intelligence. And that may be really helping the Ukrainians when it comes to targeting. For example, they've taken out 12 Russian generals. But another thing which I think is going to cause trouble possibly, potentially in the coming weeks, is all this equipment that's coming in, Western equipment. The Ukrainians are being trained on it in other countries, mainly in Poland, I think. But how are they going to maintain it? It's not going to be easy just to suddenly get those skills. So it's quite likely that people will have to come in with that, uh, with that equipment. Those people are likely to be American contractors. Those are usually former American military now working for private companies. Remember, we saw them all over Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, big blokes from Texas who were no longer in the military. What are the Russians going to think those are? Are they going to think that they're just working purely for the Ukrainian government? Or are they going to see that again as American NATO involvement? I think that this is going to be causing some worries in other NATO capitals.